I hope. Okay, and uh, I'll wish everybody a Hanukkah Sameach. It is good to see you. Um, we are in the third... Oh, um, before I forget, we do not have class the next two weeks, so I want to make sure that everybody is aware of that. We do not have class on the 22nd and 29th. Those are the, uh, those are the two dates, and then we resume after that. But do remember that we have, as I sent out in the email the other day, um, our major day of Tanakh study coming up on the 27th. I sent that out yesterday. There was actually a mistaken link in there. If you clicked on the link, you might have ended up seeing our 2017 Tanakh program. But hopefully you saw the information on the flyer. I hope to see all of you there on the, uh, the 27th. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be great. It's, um, we're looking at 13 different passages and stories in Tanakh that speak about illness and healing. So uh, do make sure to be there. Maybe I'll send out the flyer to our, uh, to our group again at some point. But, um, okay, that's all in terms of, uh, in terms of, of the next two weeks. Um, today, our session is dedicated by, first of all, as part of the series, by Dana and Ilan Rubinstein. And then this particular session is also linked to the following gifts from our Day of Giving that we held in July from Dina and Donnie Shiner and Esther Schwartz Luft. So thank you. So we were in chapter three and talking about Mordechai's refusal to bow. And the problem that we had is that you're allowed to bow to human beings. You're not allowed to bow to idolatry. We couldn't understand not only why he refused the first time, but why he continued to refuse to bow even after the threat to the Jews. So our first approach, which we brought last week, was that bowing would have been a form of idolatry. And we had three different ideas within that. Um, idea number one, that, that Haman made himself into an idol to be worshipped, declared himself godlike. Second possibility was that Haman was wearing idols around his neck. And third possibility was that the concern was lest he appear to worship idols. That was Tosvos' idea. Um, we supported all of these approaches by noting, as Professor Amos Chacham notes in his commentary to Esther, that the language of the language of kneeling and bowing that's used here is not like other bowings that appear in Tanakh where you bow to a human being. These really seem to be acts of religious bowing. That supports the read that this is, in fact, about idolatry. One additional note, um, you know, last week I mentioned the possibility that saying that Haman was wearing an idol around his neck may be, in some sense, an anti-Christian polemic because priests wore crosses around their necks. So Janine asked the question, how long ago were they actually doing that? Meaning this midrash is recorded 5th century, 6th century. Um, were they already doing that back then? So if you take a look at your source sheet, I brought you source number one from Wikipedia, that source of all information, whether it's correct or not. Um, the, uh, an article on the pectoral cross, the cross worn on one's chest. One of the earliest mentions of a pectoral, pectoral cross is, men is it's mentioned by Pope Hilarius in 461. Um, and then in 811, Nicophorus sent Pope Leo III a golden pectoral cross. The widespread official use, however, did not begin in the Western Church until around the 14th century. So the answer seems to be it existed um, at the time that the Midrash would have been recorded, although it was not necessarily widespread. Okay. All of that is for what we said last time. Oh, and we also had that additional very interesting suggestion from Yoram Chazoni. Uh, he threw out the idea that, um, that state-ordered power, when it, is, um, when it is held by one person, is in and of itself inherently idolatrous, because it doesn't allow for the conflict of views that will ultimately lead to, um, to hopefully, um, you know, something reflecting the mainstream of society as a whole. Okay. Uh, what I wanted to do with it this week is go in a very different direction, and that is that Mordechai refuses to bow as a statement about Jewish identity. He wants to declare that Jews are not subordinate to the Persians. 
And so, as the text in chapter 3 of Esther actually says, he gid lahem ashehu Yehudi. He said, I am from Yehud. Yehud, we said already weeks ago, was the name that the Babylonians and Persians used for Judea. We saw that in the book of Ezra. We saw that in the book of Daniel. So he's saying, I am from Yehud. I am not some slave to the Persians. This is supported by the fact that Cyrus, that first Persian king who conquered the Babylonians, not the first Persian king, but he's the king who conquered the Babylonians, treated the Jews with respect and empowered us to return to Judea. So Mordechai is saying, you can't treat me that way. You can't force me to bow. And this would actually connect really well with three events in the book of Daniel. We've already seen other connections between the book of Esther and the book of Daniel. We saw the suggestion that Mordechai and Esther have Babylonian names, just like Daniel and his allies were given Babylonian names. We had Ibn Ezra's idea that Daniel actually elevated Mordechai to a position of power in Persia, which is how Mordechai gets to be at the royal gate at Sha'ar HaMelech, that Daniel has been meddling. We saw the idea as well that Daniel might have given Esther the idea to ask for seeds. Daniel in his role as Hatach, perhaps, as we talked about. Well, here... The refusal to bow as a statement of national identity, that would really, really fit with Daniel. Take a look, please, on your sheets at source number two. I gave you links there for three different passages in Daniel, which, which reflect this idea of refusing to bow, refusing to give up one's pride in one's national identity. The first reference there is chapter 1 in Daniel, and that's the story we've already discussed regarding the vegetarianism. The, uh, when Daniel says, I don't want to have, I don't want to eat the food from the king's table, he says, the, uh, yeah, I'm not interested in having that food. It seems not to be an issue of keeping kosher. There's some discussion of whether that was the reason. But Rav Meidan in Israel, in his work, Daniel Galut Vihit Galut, promotes the idea that it was Daniel saying, we shall not lose our identity to become like the, uh, to come like the Babylonians. That's number one. Rabbi? Yes. So I interrupt. I don't have my source sheet. I have no idea why I get one. So I oh, you don't have the source sheet. Are you on the email list? Rucham, are you on the email list? I did send it out, but I'll put it in the chat now so that people can get it that way. But if you're not... I'm on the email list. I can't hear you. What? Uh, if anyone is not getting the emails for the class, do me a favor, please, and, um, and email me or send me a message in the chat to, because the, um, if you're not getting the emails, you will not have the source sheet. Okay. That's pretty, uh, pretty much the way it works. Hang on. And okay, it's there in the chat now. Okay, how do I access it? Um, you go to chat. Do you know how to do that? I graduated from chat. Right, so this is a little bit of a different one. If you see a button on the bottom of the screen that says chat, yes. click that. And then you will see the chat open on the right side of your screen. There it is. Yes. Okay. So, Daniel chapter 3 they, um, has the story in which Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Daniel's three associates, refuse to bow to a statue. Right? For those who are not that familiar with the story, we're not going to read it out now um, you know, from, the, uh, from the text. But I'm going to give you a quick digest, but you can look at the reference that I gave you there in source number two to be able to see it. In that story, King Nebuchadnezzar decrees that he's making a statue entirely of gold. And everybody, when they hear music play, everybody is responsible to bow to 
this great big statue. That's the um, that's what um, that's what happens there in the chapter. And Hananiah and Bishal and Azariah, Daniel's allies, refuse to bow. Where is Daniel for this story is a great discussion for another time. But the point is that they refuse to bow. And Don Isaac of Barbanel says it wasn't about idolatry. This was not an idol. And there is a lot of discussion about this. Those who were with me when we learned Daniel will remember the back and forth as to whether this was idolatry, wasn't idolatry. But we're just doing the short form of the conversation. And in the short form of this, we remember that in Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And in this dream, he saw a great big statue, its head made of gold, Right? And then the, as you move down the body, it changes materials. It becomes silver, then it becomes copper, and then it becomes iron and clay. And then the stone comes out and knocks down the statue, and everything breaks apart. And Daniel is the only one who is able to tell him what he dreamed and what it means. And what Daniel says to, uh, to Nebuchadnezzar is that this dream represents the pattern of empires. Babylon is gold, the top of the statue. They are the greatest and the most powerful right now, but empires rise and fall. And so there's another empire coming represented by silver. They're going to replace you. And then another one represented by copper. They're going to replace them. And so on to the iron and clay. And all the commentators explain which empires they think this refers to. Not our discussion right now. But... In the end, Hashem is going to establish a kingdom represented by the stone in this vision, and they are going to demolish the lot of them. Well, in that light, when Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 3 sets up a statue that is entirely of gold, he's trying to say, Babylon forever. We're never ending. We're not going to be replaced by silver and copper and whatnot. It's Babylon now? and Babylon forever. Take a look, please, at a Barbanel in source number three. Reading my translation aloud, I'm skipping the Hebrew in the interests of time. The entire statue, head to toe, was of gold, demonstrating that all empires to come after him and reign over the world would be from his descendants and the Babylonian empire. Not only the head is going to be gold, but also the arms and thighs and loins of this statue. And so he instructed that they gather from all the nations and tongues throughout his empire and that all would fall and bow before that idol to hint that they would be humbled and conquered before his reign eternally. And therefore, this was performed with music. We said when the instruments play, that's when everybody bows, like a king's coronation. But Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah did not want to bow to that statue. It's not idolatry. It's a statue representing a kingdom. But they believed truly and enduringly in the order of the four empires. In that dream, they longed for the fifth empire. Therefore, they did not want to accept upon themselves this eternal empire, which would be the opposite of their belief and tradition. They are refusing to accept Babylon as their rulers. And that's why they refuse to bow, and they're willing to die for it. They're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. You follow? So... That's a second example from the book of Daniel of someone refusing to give in, in this case, actually refusing to bow, not for religious reasons. I mean, religion is tied into every. Hang on, Muhammad. Religion is tied into everything, but not primarily as a religious act. This isn't idolatry. It's a statement instead that we are not going to be cowed and we're not going to lose our identity. Okay, Muhammad. So the, the, right, so the, his dream about the tree in, in, in Paragdalit is a different story. That's a dream about him personally. It's not about his kingdom. Oh, yeah. Right, right. But the third case in the book of Daniel, where you see this, is Daniel chapter 6. Classic. In Daniel chapter 6, there's a king by the name of Darius. We've talked about this before. There's a king by the name of Darius who is told by his advisors that he should do the following for 30 days. He has this great big system set up in which he doesn't have to ever govern. He can just 
hide and let everybody else be taken care of by his representatives. But they say to him, you know, for the first 30 days, what you should do is make a rule that no one is able to ask anyone else for any favors or any necessities or anything. If anyone in the city needs anything and the capital needs anything, they have to go straight to you, King Darius which is a ludicrous thing for a governor to do. It's a ludicrous thing for a king to do. They'll demolish you. Everybody who needs anything has to come to you. You have to worry about everybody's needs for 30 days. Forget it. But their plan, as presented in Daniel chapter 6, is to use this as a means of undermining Daniel. Because Daniel is known to pray to God three times a day. As the text says in Daniel chapter 6, sentence 11, this is what he always did. He had done that even before the exile. And so, they're going to have witnesses see him pray to God. Instead of asking King Darius, that will be a violation of the rules, and he'll get thrown to the lions. Which, of course, is exactly what happens. So, Daniel knows that there is a decree. Daniel hears that there is a decree. And yet he goes to his window and he prays, knowing full well he's going to get caught. But he refuses. Not because, once again, he didn't have to, under Jewish law, he did not have to give up his life for this. First of all, you just pray inside. Right? You didn't have to pray at the window. But number two, even if it meant don't pray, he could have done that. He fa yeah, you could do that inside also. You don't have to stand at your window to do that. He did face, you're right, he faces Yerushalayim. That's what it says in the text. But you don't have to stand at the window in order to do it. You know, Barbanel actually floats the idea that maybe this was more private than he used to do it. Maybe he used to do it outside. Unclear. He's standing at the window. If you wanted to do it in private, your first step is step away from the window. Right? That's, that's kind of step number one. So... The point that I'm trying to show you here is that Daniel has so much to do with what happens in the book of Esther, as we've already seen. And here, it could be Mordechai is refusing to bow, not because of idolatry, but rather on principle. Because you can't take me away from my identity as a Jew and have me bow to this representative of Persian power. I don't do that. This would also fit... Susan, you were going to say? I just wonder, was that written in... It's not Hebrew that it's written in. That, what's I'm written reading, in? I'm reading the... Daniel? Yeah, no, that's Aramaic. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, good chunk of Daniel is in Aramaic. That's correct. Okay. So, in, in uh, this idea would fit with the Talmud in source number four. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's students asked him, following the classic idea that cause and effect in Tanakh is often a function of either reward or punishment, the Jews must have had some reason why. They deserved what happened to them in the book of Esther. Why did they deserve this? They asked Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Take a look at number four. Why did they deserve to be destroyed? So he says to the students, you tell me. And what did the students say back? They went to Achashverosh's party. What's the big deal about going to the party? It does not seem to be about tray food. That does not seem to be the consideration. No one here says that this was about tray food. It's acknowledging. It's acknowledging Ahasuerus's rule over us, precisely. And especially if you take the idea we've talked about, that this was a feast that represented the subjugation of the Jews. So the only question that I have against this idea is, then why specifically Haman? You wouldn't bow to anybody representing Persian power. So it could be that Haman was the only one who actually demanded bowing. Right? The way the text presents it, it can read that way. It could be Haman is the only one who is, uh, who is demanding bowing. But Professor Yonatan Grossman points out a very interesting idea. I think he's Bar Yilan. He suggests that it's because Haman is from Amalek. 
Remember, Haman, son of Hamadatta of Agag. So since he's from Amalek, Mordechai refuses to bow. Which would actually work really nicely when you think about it. Because remember, Mordechai's ancestor is Binyamin. And Binyamin was the only one in the family who did not bow to Amalek's grandfather, Esav. So you have a pattern of not bowing to them. Could be. So both of these approaches we've outlined. The idea that Mordechai won't bow because of idolatry or that Mordechai won't bow because of identity, both of those feed into the idea that the book of Esther is guiding a nation living in exile, right? We said, what's unique about the book of Esther? It's all about an exile experience. This is not speaking to a nation that is in its land, building up a government, dealing with enemies from outside and all that. This is speaking to the Jews as an exile population. And it's making a statement either about not accepting idolatry or not appearing to accept idolatry or about standing firm in your Jewish identity. It's giving some very strong messages, although it's also a warning it can get you killed, so be careful. The, um, but there's a caveat. And the caveat is that the, the Talmud, when it discusses this, is realistic about how Mordechai's peers would have viewed him. Take a look at source number five. This is always interesting. Amar Rabba Barbarchana Amr Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. This is commenting, I should give you the background, sorry. In context, this passage in the Talmud is discussing how Mordechai is identified in the Megillah as both Yehudi and Yemini, right? Yehudi, we assume, means tribe of Yehuda, not just someone from Yehud. Not necessarily, but that's the assumption. And Yemini means that he is from Benyamin. How can you be from both? So we've already addressed this somewhat, but look at this passage. Rabbi Babarchana quotes Rabbi Shua ben Levi with the first answer saying, he was from both tribes. Father was from Benyamin, mother was from Judah. Ah, we very rarely list who the mother's tribe is. Yeah, it's true. Does happen. Those who were in my class about Hanukkah and the war on the aristocracy will recall that the craftsmen in the beginning of the first base Hamikdash were identified as descendants from Dun and from Naphtali through their mother. So don't tell me it never happens. It does happen. But still, it would be unusual. But then you get these other answers. Rabbanan Amri, the sages said, Mishpachos Misgaros Zubazu. Each tribe, the tribe of Yehuda and the tribe of Binyamin, claimed credit for Mordechai. He's from us. What do you mean? So in order to know what's coming next, in order to understand what's coming next, you need a little bit of backstory. In the time of David HaMelech, of King David, he faces a rebellion from his son Avshalom. And during that rebellion, he is forced to flee Jerusalem. And a man by the name of Shimi ben Gera attacks David. And David chooses not to kill him. It's a long story. Not that long in Tanakh. It's a long story. In any case, you have to know that as background for this. If you want to know more about it, look at Shmuel Bet, chapter 16. You can see the story there. But that's, that's important here because Mordechai was introduced to us as Ben Yair, Ben Shim'i, Ben Kish. There's a Shim'i in Mordechai's past. So now read the text. I'm going to go with my English translation here for clarity purposes. And the sages said the families quarreled with each other, meaning to claim credit for Mordechai. Judah said, I caused Mordechai to be born, as David did not kill Shimi ben Gera. King David from Judah could have killed Shimi from Benjamin, and then there would have been no Mordechai. He didn't do that. Mordechai is from us. To which Benjamin said, yeah, but he is from Benjamin, you know. <laughs> like, he's still a Benjaminite. Good, you didn't prevent him from being born. Thank you, that's, we appreciate that. But, but really, he's, he's ours. But that's one way that it's taken here. And then you get the other approach. 
Rava says, no, it's the opposite. No one wants to claim credit for Mordechai. They're angry at Mordechai. He's, Knesset Yisrael Amr Le'idach Gisa. The Jews said the opposite. What do you mean? See what this one from Judah did to me and how the Benjaminite paid me. What do you mean? The one from Yehuda did to me in that David didn't kill Shimei. If David had killed Shimei, then Mordechai would not have been around to refuse to bow to Haman and we never would have been under threat in the first place. It's his fault that we had this whole problem. Whereas... The, the response is, those people from Benjamin are the ones who are at fault. The, uh, because Shaul, King Saul, he was supposed to kill Agag, ancestor of Haman. He didn't do so, and that's why Haman was born. So each one puts the blame on the other. The blame goes to Mordechai, and the blame goes to, uh, to Shaul. So that's the other way to, uh, to read this. But the, the text is giving us, I think, an important exile lesson regarding how Jews act when they are in exile. And especially this argument of if Mordechai hadn't started up with them, then none of this would have happened. That's also a point of view which you will hear heard. Okay. That's on the business of Mordechai not bowing. There is lots, lots more, as I've said already, that we could be discussing regarding, um, regarding this chapter. There's so much going on, Mordechai's conduct and so on. But I really wanted to spend some time on the lottery because I think the lottery is key to so much about this holiday. It's a meaningful part of the story and it's meaningful to Haman. How do I know that? How do you know the lottery is important in this story? What, what gives you that, that information? So, for one thing, it gives the holiday its name, right? Take a look, please. It shows up for the first time in chapter 3, sentence 7. You see that? This is when he first casts the lots. Bachodesh HaRishon Uchodesh Nisan, in the first month, the month of Nisan, right? Don't be surprised, by the way, that we're referencing Haman acting in the month of Nisan, keep in mind those names are Babylonian names for the months. They're not, they're not ours. The Persians would have had them by inheriting them from the Babylonians, just like we did. So, on the first, in the first month of Nisan, the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, he peeled poor. He set up this lot. Hu HaGoral, that is the lottery. Lifnei Haman, before Haman, miyom liyom, mechodesh lechodesh, nemasai uchodesh adar. From day to day, from month to month, the twelfth month, the month of Adar. By the way, there's a lot of wording in that sentence that is very hard to understand, and we have to come back to. I'm not abandoning that. We are going to understand that sentence better, at least within Maldam's view, before we're done. So, in sentence seven, we find out, <coughs> excuse me, that the um, that there was a lottery before Haman. Fine. Jump to chapter nine, sentence twenty-four. Recap of the story. This is the end of the book, and at this point, we're retelling what happened, and we're told. For Haman ben Hamadatta Ha'agagi was the attacker of all of the Jews, thought to destroy them. Vihipil pur hu ha'goral. He cast lots in order to destroy them. And then it came before the king, and the king said, no way. Right? Tell me something. Why did you need to mention the lottery? I understand you mentioned it in chapter 3, because this is what Haman did in order to come up with the date. But is that like a critical part of the recap? You would never believe how bad Haman was. He cast lots in order to find a day to kill us. Like, okay. Casting lots wasn't the problem. It's the killing us part that's the problem. He can cast lots all day long if he wants to decide what to eat din you know, for dinner with lots. I don't care about that. Not only that, as was pointed out, it gives the holiday the name. 
Take a look. It's sentence 26 in that same chapter, 926. Therefore, we call this day Furim. I know you used to saying Purim, but the word is Furim there. They, um, we, we call it Purim because he cast lots. I don't know. Maybe you should have called it Kill the Jews Day because he tried to kill the Jews. That's a lot more memorable. The, um, like, this, is, this is so odd. You could have called it the holiday of Esther. Right? You could have called it the holiday of Esther. Why, why, do, you, why do you call it the holiday of Haman's lots? It, it, you know, um, Professor Grossman notes that our holidays tend to be named for their essential elements. So what name do we have for the holiday when we go sit outside in a hut? Sukkot, right. What's the name that we use for the holiday that comes after we've counted seven weeks? Shavuot. What's the name of the holiday on which we eat matzah? No. Chag HaMatzot. The Torah does not call it Chag HaPesach. Correct. Pesach is the name of the 14th of Nisan, the day before when you bring the carbon Pesach. The, um, the holiday itself is Chag HaMatzot. It's the holiday of matzah because you eat matzah. Like, because that's not what the Torah credits it with. The Torah says, count 49 days, seven weeks, Shiva Shavuot Tisparlach. That's what the Torah says. The Torah never tells you that that's why you're celebrating. You're celebrating Bikurim, so it also calls it Chag HaBikurim, and you're celebrating the counting until you can bring the Korban from the new wheat. That's all it says. It doesn't say anything about, um, about Matan Torah. So there's no reason to call it that. So should we call it um, we should call Hanukkah Chag Halakis. There you go. Well, if it's about the celebration that we choose to make, yeah. If it's and about the original essential. celebration, it's Hanukkah. It's, it, it's, it's more about Hanukkah than it is about heart problems. So, the, um, but the question here is, you're calling it Purim. For what? Even more fascinating is something the Malbim does here. The Malbim is really troubled by the wording of that sentence in chapter 3 that we pointed out. Go back again, please, to chapter 3, sentence 7. Malbim, again, is your man for anything related to language. He is on it. And here, he says something which is also found in Ibn Ezra, but Malbim fleshes it out and connects it to the language in the text. Two problems in the text that he picks up on. Number one, the language of he peeled poor hu ha goral lifnei haman. How do you translate those words? Those who are working with translations, how do you translate those? He peeled poor hu ha goral lifnei haman. So, sorry, so what was the beginning of that? So one cast, somebody cast a lot before Haman. Do you know why they say that? I know. The, no, I don't want you to look down there. I want you to look at the text and tell me why they say that. Look at the English or the Hebrew. The reason why they're saying that is because they have a problem. We understand and we assume that Haman is the one who cast the lot. But that's hard to read in the sentence. Because it says, Lifnei Haman. He cast the lot in front of Haman. So Haman didn't cast the lot. So that's why Susan's edition says, yes, someone cast the lot in front of Haman. But that doesn't make any sense at all. That's a pronoun without an antecedent. And we always say Haman was the one who did it. That's, that's just not right. Anybody have a different translation? Ooh, they cast the lot. Now we got multiple people. Multiple who's. That doesn't work either. I'm sorry. Not, not he pilu? Sorry? It, it, wouldn't it say he pilu? Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah, no, I, I don't like that read. Sorry. Could it be, Hash, could it be Hashem? Could it be Hashem? Oh, I boy. I only have Hebrew, so I don't know. Hashem, Hashem picked, picked up the lot for him? No. No, no. In other words, in other words could it be a reference that, that you know, again, that we know that Hashem made it happen on that day? 
Mm, yeah, that's working too hard. That's working too hard. So I'll tell you how to read it. And this is the way Maldon reads it. He peeled poor. Haman. Oh, one second. Maish has his hand up. What, what, what's the answer, Maish? I don't know what the answer is. Okay, then Maish, hold off. Sorry, hold off then. We're answering this question. The, um... I'm answering the question. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm going to suggest a very simple answer. There were several different types of lotteries that were running in Persia at the time. And this particular lottery that he used was the poor lottery. So you're correct about that, but what's the pronoun who? When it says who, it says, um, sorry, when it says he peel, sorry, when it says he peel, who was my peel? So you're close. So you've got to watch these programs. Seriously, I'm I'm not joking. There's always a guy who's in charge. There's somebody in charge of the ball, the the, the round thing. There's somebody else in charge. Everybody wants to have a part of it. So, you know, he was was the top man in his big turban. And there were other people around. So I think this may be where you're going, but I'm not sure. But let's see. Watch the Hebrew. He peeled poor. Haman cast the lot. Who Hagoral Lifne Haman? That was the lottery that he always had with him. Not he peel Lifne Haman. He peel poor who Hagoral Lifne Haman. He cast a lot. What is that lot? The lottery that Haman always had. In other words, Haman was a regular lottery player. Haman used to go to shoppers every week and go get the lottery tickets. So I'm joking about that. Haman had a lottery that he kept with him at all times. This helps us understand Haman's character. That's number one. So why, why, if we don't call it Hagabur, we call Hang on, we're getting there. We're getting there, we're getting there, we're getting there. Slow down. Uh, so take a look now at Malbim in source number seven, because he picks on this as well as that odd phrase, miyom liyom e chodesh lachodesh, from day to day, from month to month. He says the following, and again, I'm going to read out my English translation in order to save time. This lottery was of the type of lotteries called a poor. This lottery was regularly before Haman to cast lots with it at all times. This is his identity. The, um, this is, who, Mort- this is who, who Haman is. He is a caster of lots. Okay. But he's not done. Via this lottery, he cast lots from day to day. The lottery was on the 13th day of Nisan. How do I know the 13th of Nisan? If you look at sentence 12, it says that they called all of the scribes on the 13th and told them to do dot, dot, dot. So that was the day later. That was once he had gotten Ahasuerus' permission. So it's the 12th of Nisan, um, I'm sorry, it's the 13th of Nisan when he does this. And certainly Haman wanted to punish the nation of God immediately. The assumption that Malbim makes you could argue it, but the assumption Malbim makes is that, uh, that Haman would want to do this today. If he has to wait till tomorrow, he'll wait till tomorrow. But he wants this done immediately. So he casts his lots starting with the next day. He started his lottery from the 14th of Nisan, which was the next day. Didn't work. He again cast lots for the 15th and 16th of Nisan. The lottery perpetually rejected him until the end of the days of the month. So it's not one time that he's casting lots, Ruchama. He's casting multiple Purim. He's casting multiple lots. Day after day after day. Maybe it'll be this one. Maybe it'll be this one. Maybe this one. Nope, 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 nope. And he reaches the next month. He goes all through Nisan. And now he's at the first of Iyar. And the lottery rejected him, miyom liyom, from day to day until the last day, the 13th of Iyar. For the lottery had to fall on one of the days for which it was cast. Eventually, it has to hit. That's the structure of the lottery. So he gets the last possible date. He's gone entirely around from the 14th of Nisan all the way to the 13th day of Iyar. Okay. Hashem designed it to fall on the last possible day so that Israel would gain time. But he's not done. 
Then Haman thought perhaps the month would not be successful. He began to cast lots for months. He started from Nisan, the month he was in. Lottery didn't work. And so the lottery rejected him, mechodesh lechodesh, from month to month. Until the last month, Adar. Therefore, it said, from day to day and from month to month, the lottery first rejecting him from day to day and then from month to month. So in other words, what happens here is the, um, that Haman is casting lots and being pushed off from day to day to day to day until the last possible date. Hashem offering us the maximum amount of time for us to be able to thwart the decree. You realize it, it's a very, it's a very interesting read. Ibn Ezra also says it, but he doesn't flesh it out the way Malbim does. He doesn't explain. Ibn Ezra just says, yeah, Haman got the last possible date. But it's really remarkable. He starts out trying for the 14th of Nisan, and he ends up with the 13th of the following Adar. Okay. So now I don't understand anything, though, right? Now I don't understand anything. Because why did Haman stick with the dumb lottery? I don't understand Right? When you're, when you're a kid, right, and you have to flip a coin, heads I'll do this, tails I'll do that, and then it turns up the wrong one, what do you do? Two out of three. Right? Three out of five. Anything to get the result you want. What if Haman got the wrong date, right, the date he did not want, why didn't he simply overturn it? Yes, Moish. Because, uh, Totally. So one answer is what Moshe is saying, which is, this is what Haman does. This is who he is. Everything he succeeded in came about because of this in his mind. So he's going he's gonna to stick with it, live by the sword, die by the sword. Live by the lottery, die by the lottery. And you could say that. Carla puts a note in the chat asking maybe that there was an astrological aspect. Well, take a look at source number eight on your sheet, the Gemara in Megillah, which plays with that idea. Maybe this is why Haman went along with it. When the lot fell in the month of Adar, he said, oh, this is awesome. Omar Nafa Lipur Biyerach Shemes Lo Moshe. He said that's when Moses died. Does Haman know that? Apparently. The, um, that's the month when Moshe died. That's a terrible month for Jews. Not realizing, yeah, but he's also born then. So in other words, the idea is Haman sticks with it because he thinks that this is a fortuitous time to attack the Jews. Because of Moshe, because of astrology, whatever, however you want to read that, uh, that idea. Maybe, maybe. However, I think that there's another element going on here. What does a lottery mean in the Torah in general? Where do we use lotteries in the Torah? In what cases? That's not a lottery. That's, that's turning that's to God for answers. That's different. Yoshua. Yoshua used the lottery how many times, Hannah? Sorry, can't hear you. Hannah, you're muted. Good. Yoshua does a lottery twice. Once in Yoshua chapter 7 in which he has to figure out which Jew ate from or took from the spoils from, from Yericho against the rules. That's one case. The other case you reference is actually a fulfillment of what, he was, what Moshe said to do in Bamidbar Perek Chava, Bamidbar 26, which was, The land of Israel is going to be divided up by lottery. So Yoshua cast lots to determine which tribe gets which land. But there's an earlier use of lottery in the Torah. Vayikra chapter 16 in source number 9. Tell me, what's in Vayikra chapter 16? This is one of those chapters we should know. Sorry? 
The Sa'ir Lazazel. On Yom Kippur, you take two goats. One goat is going to be a korban, an offering for God, and the other one is going out into the wilderness. And we're told that you use a goral, you use a lottery to decide which one is which. And then one more lottery in Tanakh. There may be more. This list is not exhaustive. But one more lottery in Tanakh in the book of Yonah. Right? When the sailors want to know why is all of this happening to us, they cast a goral. They cast a lot. So, this is a list of at least four cases in which you are using a lottery. Do these sound like random, you know, attempts at just randomness? Are these lotteries meant to be random? Chana shakes her head no. How do you know that? Well, the Choshen isn't involved in dividing up the land. The Choshen is not involved in dividing up the land. But... Right. You can't, right. You can't seriously think that we're, that we're intentionally, randomly choosing who took from the spoils of Yericho to kill them. That doesn't make any sense at all. The sailors explicitly say... We are trying to figure out who God wants to zap. It's not about just taking a random person on the boat and, uh, and, and throwing them overboard. The, um, the division of the land into lots, the Torah says explicitly that it was based on the needs of each tribe. Right? There's a whole discussion in the commentators to Yoshua, chapter 14, comes up again in chapter 18, trying to understand how you can square it being a lottery and on the other hand, fitting with each tribe's needs. It's a lot of discussion. It's a fascinating discussion, not for right now. But the point is that you're not trying to do something random. I should note, Rav Soloveitchik had a beautiful idea, which you can see in an essay in the book, Reflections of the Rav, in which he points to randomness in the goral, randomness in the lottery of the two goats, that it's meant to reflect our reality. But looking at it less homiletically and more literally, this is not meant to be random. These are attempts to figure out what Hashem wants. That's what a goral is. A goral is, I am taking my personal preferences out in order to say, it's going to be what it's going to be. Hashem is going to do what Hashem is going to do. So, for example, in the story with um, the, the lottery for land, take a look at source number 10, please. Malbim points out something very interesting. Ruham Amma. Uh, isn't it uh, when uh, Yaakov gave the blessing and you say, let's say, Sulul lechof yami mishkon? Nachon, ze gam ken bebrachot shel Yaakov ve gam ken shel Moshe. What Ruham is pointing out is that the portions of particular tribes were predicted in the blessings given by Yaakov in the end of the book of Breshit and the blessings given by Moshe at the end of the book of Devarim. So we also have that. That just testifies to the fact that the lottery is not meant to be random. It's meant to be God confirming who should be where. But take a look at source number 10. Malvin points out, with his wonderful ear for language, that there are two different verbs that you can use when it comes to casting a lot. One is lahashlich, and the other one is lirot. Separate from hipil, which you see in, uh, in Esther. And he says, Hamashlich, one who casts a lot, doesn't aim for a known point. You just throw the dice, and wherever they fall, they fall. One who shoots, more, aims for a known point. Like one who shoots arrows, always firing at the target. In modern Hebrew, to fire a gun is lirot. Yoshua knew by tradition the position of each tribe and where and how its boundary would fall. As Ruchama notes, Yaakov and Moshe blessed each tribe according to its land and their blessings. For Yehoshua, it was Lirot, to be Moreh. 
However, the act that you do is lahashlich, to throw it as though you have no idea. The goal being to confirm for everybody, I didn't rig this. Look, it just happened, it came out that way. The same thing is true for the lottery to figure out who took from the spoils of Yericho. Yoshua has a great fear in that story that people are going to claim that he rigged the lottery in order to get at Achan. This goes back to something that I think Ruchama had wanted to say. No, sorry, it wasn't you. It was in uh, my Shmuel Shir last Thursday. Someone had wanted to talk about this a little bit. The, um, the Achan comes from what tribe? Achan who gets in trouble for taking from the spoils. Yehuda, Achan ben Kami ben Zavdi ben Zerach ben Zavach ben Zerach lamate Yehuda. Achan is from Yehuda. Yoshua is from what tribe? Yosef. Well, originally yeah, he's from Ephraim. He's from he's from Ephraim, who is from Yosef. Point being, Yoshua traces his lineage back to Ephraim, Yosef, Rachel. The, I'm sorry, Ach, Ach, I'm not sure which one I just said. Achan traces his lineage back to Yehuda, back to Leah. Yoshua traces his lineage back to Ephraim, back to Yosef, back to Rachel. People might have accused Yehuda, uh, Yehoshua of specifically targeting the tribe of Yehuda. Yoshua is worried about charges of bias. I'm doing a goral. I'm doing a lottery. Whatever happens, happens. Now there the Choshen may be involved, by the way, Chana. That's its own discussion. But the, um, but the, the point is that you do the lottery to figure out what it is that Hashem wants. And the same thing is true, Rakshniya Chana, the same thing is true if you take a look in source number 11 in the Madrash and Bereshit Rabbah where it talks about a verse in Mishlei, in Proverbs, that talks about lotteries, the, uh, the lottery being cast, and all of its judgment comes from God. What is it talking about? It's talking about the lottery of Yom Kippur and the lottery for the land. The judgment cast by the lot is actually all from God. Okay, we've said a lot of things here. There's more that we could say. There's a lot more we could say, but it's 2.24, and I want to make sure that, that I get in some key points. So I'm just writing down an address that was sent to me in the, uh, in the chat to, uh, to add. Hold on one second. Okay. The point is this. Lotteries are not about randomness in Tanakh. Lotteries are about figuring out what it is that God wants. We find idolatry being associated with lots, right? The Torah specifically says you're not allowed to engage in nichush, trying to figure out what it is that uh, God wants through various methods because it could lead you to believe in the idols that were, that were associated with these lotteries. So here, the Goral is part of the book's religious message. Haman is a religious man. What religion it was? Was it Zoroastrianism? Was it something else? I don't know. But Haman is a religious man. He's trying to figure out how to get God on his side. That's why he casts the lot. And that's why he sticks with it, even when he gets the worst possible date. In fact, as we read it, we find out that God is on our side because he gave us the maximum amount of time before this decree would play out. And here I want to add one more idea. Susan, I see you. Moish, I see you. The, um, but I just want to, want to conclude with this point. Professor Yonatan Grossman points you to the Encyclopedia Mikra'it and the entry on Rosh Hashanah, which I think is very interesting. I cannot find any corroborating source for this. Nonetheless, Encyclopedia Mikra'it often knows what it's talking about, about secular things. So take a look at this. In the interest of time, I'm just going to read out my English translation. It's source number 12. The holiday of Rosh Hashanah in Babylon, not Persia, Babylon, 
was taken as the time for establishing lots for the entire year. In truth, the casting of lots was arranged twice on the holiday. On the 5th or 6th of Nisan in the sanctuary of Nebo in Babylon called the Palace of the Lots, and a second time on the 11th after Merodach returned from the house of Akatu. Now, the Persian New Year, Nauruz, is supposed to be based on the Babylonian Akatu. In truth, from what I've read, there are some key differences about when the celebration is and a little bit more, but nonetheless, if it's true that the Persians were casting lots at their new year, the beginning of Nisan, for what will be in the year ahead, then we are meant to read Haman casting lots early in Nisan about the Jews to be an example of that. And we're getting a message here. Haman represents the Persian New Year, the Persian religious celebration, and the Jew in exile is being told, don't worry about it. God is going to, uh, is going to take care of it. God has the upper hand. But even without that, the message here is that the poor is much, much more important than just Haman's mechanism for finding the date. The poor is at the heart of this. The argument is that it's all about God, and the response of the Megillah, I'm sorry, the argument there is that it's, is that it's all about the, uh, the lottery and God is on their side. And the response of the Megillah is no, God is on, uh, is on our side and we're going to name the holiday for the lottery in order to show that. Okay, Susan, you were very patient. What's up? He believes this is what his God wants. But from what, based on what? So, number one, we already saw Kriyava Hishtachavaya, a form of bowing, which in Tanakh is a religious bowing, right? That we already saw. But number two, the fact that he does this lottery, which doesn't seem to be about chance. That's the whole point that we've been emphasizing here. It's not about chance. If it was about chance, he would have rejected it. That so that's what I'm saying, is that so he believes that this is... This is a, a divine mission for him. So he believes lotteries are, so when he's lost, that's God's will or his God's will. Yeah. When he wins, that's his God's will too. Correct. Precisely. That's the idea. Maish, what were you going to say? I know, I must have made a mistake. Oh, okay. Yes, Janine. You know, you're certainly free to read it that way. Yeah, I just, yeah, yeah, right. No, and it's an, right, and it is something that I've heard people say. I just I, that to me, the the you know the challenge has been why did he stick with it? That, in other words, they stick to randomness even to their own detriment. Okay. Whose yard site, by the way, is coming up? The, uh, his yard site is this coming week. Look at Toronto Torah this week. The, uh, that's, how we, that's, that's how I know. Okay, so thank you very much, everyone. I think we got through a couple of things that were very interesting about Mordechai refusing to bow and about the lottery. We are off for two weeks, as I said in the beginning. But I want to come back with two last notes on Haman's sales pitch and Ahasuerus declining the money, and how Ahasuerus declines the money, which I think is really, really important. And I also included on your source sheet review questions. 
the, um, the review questions are, are meant to make sure that we don't just have the in one ear, out the other phenomenon so that we can uh, you know, take with us what we've learned. I was going to go through them this time. It'll end up being a good review for us when we start up again after a break. So for that, it'll be useful as well. Um, for most people here, I'm not going to require that you actually fill these out in writing. Um, the, um, however, the, uh, if you get an email from me, set, no, just kidding. But, um, but yeah, if you do try to fill them out, if you do try to figure it out and there's something there that you can't remember, you're not sure, um, email me. I will be very glad to help refresh people's memory. Thank you so much. And I wish you a Chag Urim Sameach for the rest of Hanukkah.